church, is it good to be together? It's just fun to worship Jesus and hear people sing. Uh, I was noticing uh, quite a few people, my, there are some adults here, but the children as well, uh, wearing kind of a pinkish, dusty kind of rose color. I want to thank you because it fits right in with the sermon series that we're doing called Blush. All right, so you're as nervous as I am. <laughs> We are going to do something I have never done in, in almost 20 years of preaching. I've never preached through the book of the Song of Songs. So hold on to your seats and tell Grandma not to watch. <laughs> tell her she could pick it up in the summer, but things are going to get awesome. All right, we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to invite David up to help me out with something real quick. Do you guys love David? Thank you for your service. Thanks for who you are. For many people, um, their favorite part of the inaugural proceedings was the poem. Who's heard of the poem? Uh, young lady, young lady named Amanda Gorman, which I just have to give her two extra points because her name's Amanda. Uh, that's Mandy's given name, if you will. But she she gave a poem, and and a couple of my favorite lines were. Even as we hurt, we hope. And that transcends. I don't care about your political uh, leanings. But the idea that, that we hope through hurt is actually true hope. If I only hoped when I didn't hurt, what would that be? But instead, hope holds on. It's like, I'm hurting, but I'm hoping for something else. And I believe that's a thing of the Holy Spirit. That that's what he would do is he would help people hope through their hurt. Who has exercised that in 2020 and in 2021? <laughs> Amen. There's another line that says, being American is more than a pride that we inherit. But instead, it's the past that we step into and how we repair it. And I think there's something powerful there, too. I think every family experiences, things that come natural to you that you want to change. For some of us, sarcasm. For some of us, it's poor spending habits. For some of us, it's, it's uh, some sort of a sin. What a powerful revelation. We want to repair what we, were, what we had inherited. And I'm so glad that us here, that great work has been done, that we all turn our noses and gag on slavery. Amen? And the reason I bring this up is that what happened in the poem was something beautiful and noticeable simply because of its approach. It was a poem. It wasn't a sermon. It wasn't a writing. It was a poem that was presented. And there's something beautiful when someone presents a poem. It's like what they're saying, but it's also how they're saying it, and it's who is saying it, and it's what they're doing when they're saying it, and it's an entire kind of wonderful experience of experiencing someone use art and words in such a, in such a combined and beautiful way that it speaks straight to your heart. Do you know what I'm talking about today? And so today I want to share just a little, a few lines from a piece called Motes and Ladders. Motes and Ladders, and it's a piece that's describing the, the great um, polarity of our political culture in our nation. I don't know if you've noticed it. Ha! Things are a little dicey when it comes to people yelling at each other. Am I right or am I wrong? Used to be, hey, let's not yell. Now it's like, I will yell louder. Here's a little piece speaking to this. They built a barricade between your lips and my ears. Slogans were provided there with posters and pins thrown in. But I don't see the party in these lines. I don't see the party in these lines. This is a new. This is a new. This is a new revolution. They're policing our thoughts, and they've outlawed the dialogue. They taught us well, quick to speak, 
and slow to hear. No need to listen. It's right or left. No center position. No, I don't see the party in these lines. I don't see the party in these lines. They moved us into some castles on opposing hills. They stocked the moats and they broke the ladders so that we don't know what they know. No, I don't see the party in these lines. This is a new. This is a new. This is a new revolution. They're policing our thoughts and they've outlawed the dialogue. Do you sense it? It's different than a post. It's a different than a card from your mom. It's different than a position on a political platform. There's something profound that happens when truth is expressed in an artful way. And today we get to jump in to the book of the Song of Songs. And one thing that I want you to realize as we as we meander through it over the coming weeks is I want you to realize that this is the message of the kingdom through poetry. And so it's going to hit you different. You're all going to blush. I've never been more glad that you're all wearing masks. All right, so we're going to hop into that. Thank you, David. Give it up for David. Thank you so much, David. I mean, I just, I would love to preach with that all day. The only problem is I talk a little slower to match, you know what I'm saying? So it'd be like three hours. So everyone's like, yeah, please get off the stage, David, if it's a three-hour sermon. <laughs> I know you love me. Okay. All right. So we are. We are going to hop into uh, a, a new series called Blush. And the idea here is that we're just going to kind of walk thematically. I, I haven't decided whether we're going to walk uh, verse by verse um, or if we're just going to look at it thematically every week, but we are going to uh, walk through the book of the Song of Songs, all right? So in your Bible, it might be called the Song of Solomon or something like that, all right? But we're going to walk through this, and there is some very surprising, very intriguing, very beautiful uh, things that are going to happen, but along the way, <coughs> you will blush, okay? So just look around to somebody and say, we're all going to blush, and it's going to be awesome, all right, here we go. <laughs> if that was my daughter saying yes. All right, so the Bible is full of all sorts. I'm just keep on moving. Uh, the Bible is full of all so sorts of different ways in which God communicates. And so God is communicating in this book uh, through poetry. There's, there's a good portion of the scriptures that we would call prophetic. They are they are the, the major and the minor prophets. There is also quite a bit of history in the scriptures. There are also some letters that leaders wrote to different churches. There are what we would call, uh, we would call those the epistles. We also have quite a bit of Jesus's boots on the ground stories. And so this kind of chronological story of Jesus. We also have in the book of Revelation, uh, apocalyptic literature which uh, fits a certain, uh, a certain literary style, especially used for the day. And so uh, this whole thing also includes uh, scripture that we would call wisdom scriptures. So things like Proverbs, um, a good bit of Psalms, borders on the line of, of um, poetry and wisdom. It's funny that most of the places where we find that there's a poetic, there's a poetic kind of tone to wisdom. And I just want you to sit with that maybe in your life, that, that wisdom often uh, comes with the Holy Spirit's power when it's placed more poetically than powerfully, uh, if, if you can think about that for a minute. Um, and so the, the book of the Song of Songs, while it has quite a reputation that you're all nervous about and the reason that some people are online today uh, and the reason that all of you are being just so very, um, uh, what's the word? diligent in your mask wearing today because it is it has a reputation it's like oh boy here we go this is going to get awkward and that's going to happen but 
Most scholars place the Song of Songs uh, under the category of wisdom. So this is wisdom scripture, all right? And so if it's wisdom, there's always, uh, the scriptures are always saying two things at once, all right? So we, you're, you're going to have moments where you're going to go, does that have a double meaning in the next few weeks? The answer is yes. So if I'm reading and you go, does that mean, yes, and just keep on moving, all right? Uh, allow the scriptures to do what the author intended it to do, which is to make you blush and make you think of romantic situations. That's what this book is supposed to do. If you read it and you're like, man, I'm such a wretch. It seems like it's talking about making love. You're right. It is. But it's also saying something else at the exact same time. And so it's just an incredible bit of double meaning and beauty. Uh, so this book was written in a time uh, long before a bunch of the books were bound together. So if you, were, uh, if you were a Jew, if you were following Yahweh at this time, you might come across just the historical books, and you read those, and you go, whoa, that's crazy. You might come across just the prophetic books and just go, man, that's, that's, that's awesome. You might grab Leviticus and go, huh? But it's very possible that many people, their first and only exposure for quite some time was this book. And people go, this is the Holy Scriptures. And they're like, what? <laughs> so in other words, this book can stand on its own uh, in itself actually saying things deeper than just some sort of romance novel. And I want to show you that over the coming weeks. I think it, it has already, in the short days of really diving into this book, and, and reading uh, gobs of, of theologians on this, it has already uh, come across my mind when not studying just in everyday life. It has already done that numerous times. And don't you love it when you read the Word of God and then you just, you're working on something and you're like, boom, reminder. You're talking to someone, boom, reminder. And so I believe that the Spirit is behind what I'm doing today. Believe me, I don't sit around and go, you know, what's going to really work? I wouldn't pick this. But instead, I think the Holy Spirit has got us moving into uh, this wonderful book. And so could stand on its own, on its own but this piece of wisdom uh, is, is this poetic kind of beautiful thing that's happening. So we're going to dive into this. Um, some people would call this, and some translations call this, Solomon's Song of Songs. And so uh, some would say what it really means is this is Solomon's song. So this is either a song that Solomon wrote, or this is a song about Solomon. Okay, so Solomon, the Solomon, King Solomon, is, is involved in its writing. But the fact that it says song of songs means the greatest of. So finish this with me. The Lord of lords. The greatest of all the lords. The God of all gods, the holy of holies, the greatest of. So this, this book is presented to someone as Solomon's song of all songs. Now, do you know anything else that Solomon wrote? Any other books, any other bestsellers? What else did he write? Proverbs. Okay. And so Solomon asked for one thing. He asked for, he asked for what? Solomon asked for wisdom, and then he wrote a song. I want you to think about that. Solomon also had hundreds of concubines. Solomon was into at least two things. Wisdom and women. All right? And so we, we read his work with that backdrop, and... Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to inform us um, what this book is. Now, the Jews, the Jews framed this work as the relationship between you, a Jew, and the law. So if you go today to Israel, if you ever get a chance, spend your money and go to Israel. It will change your life. I have not read the Bible since 2013 the same way. I got to go in 2013, and when I read things, the Golan Heights, uh, where, where David killed Goliath, uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, the Temple Mount, all these things, I've been there, and I remember it, and it has changed everything. 
okay? And so um, when the Jew would read the Song of Solomon, uh, he would think that it is mainly about him loving God's laws. And so today, if you go there, they would kiss small scrolls of the law that's around them when they would pray. And so it's this kind of erotic love for God's laws. Christians would read it, and Christians, historical, um, many uh, theologians would say that this is a love story between Christ and the church, okay? So it's interesting, right? It's interesting that we have a book that could be mainly framed in two different ways by two different groups that serve Yahweh. Um, And so I think all these are helpful as learning tools, but what I'm interested in is which one is right or is there a third way to read it that actually makes the most sense? And so what I hope to present to you over the coming weeks is, is evidence that actually there's a third way of reading this which is actually more faithful to Scripture on the whole and is actually more faithful to what is actually in the book as well. Obviously, this is also having overtones and, and undertones and a whole lot of to- all the tones. It has all the tones of a relationship between man and woman, all right? Uh, you can't read it and go, I wasn't really getting that. Yeah, you were, okay? <laughs> Double meaning is going to happen. Now, um, the Hebrews uh, read it one way, Christians read another way. Now, most, most likely, all of the Song of Songs was written by one person, and that is Solomon. It's a little bit debated because it has such continuity through the whole thing. When you read the whole thing, it has the same tone. When you read the whole thing, it has the same rhythm. When you read the whole thing, it has the same characters. When you read the whole thing, it has reoccurring themes and things in it. But here's an interesting thing that that I learned um, about uh, when they're trying to figure out the veracity of a book and how it plays into the scriptures. So there's this idea that if it all harmonizes, it could be written by one person because it all harmonizes. But there's actually whole swaths of writings that were not included in the biblical canon because they matched too much. Because it was, I'm writing off this person's writing, and then we're trying to get together and make sure that our stories work. And that was actually seen as as, as a negative impact on the Holy Spirit's work in writing it. Isn't that funny? So you can read uh, Josephus, you can read uh, Tacitus, you can read some of these other books that are talking. And so it's been debated, Song of Songs, is it really just one person writing this, or instead, is it multiple people who are actually fitting it into a style, something like haiku? So if Nick wrote a haiku, and I wrote a a haiku, and and, Nick, the other Nick, because his brain works faster than the rest of us, wrote seven haikus, and we put them all in a book, you might say it's definitely written by the same person because it's got the same theme, but you also might say maybe it's written by a bunch of people. They're just fitting it into the, uh, the style of haiku, all right? And so that's been debated uh, with this book as well. So let's hop right on into our study on the Song of Songs. Are you ready? So let's hop into that by turning to... Proverbs 8. All right, so yeah. Yeah. He's not going for it, is he? He's still scared. (laughs) He's warming us up. Here we go. Proverbs 8. Who would most theologians say wrote this? All right, who would most theologians say wrote Song of Songs? All right, same writer. Here we go. We're going to start at 1. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights along the way where the paths meet and she, and she takes her stand beside the gates leading into the city? At the entrances, she cries aloud to you, O oh men, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind, you who are simple, Gain prudence. You who are foolish, gain understanding. Listen, for I have worthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. 
My mouth speaks what is true. For my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Hmm. Hmm. We're talking about a lady. And her name is Wisdom. Okay, Proverbs 3. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare to her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. We see that scripture is placing women in high esteem. Think about the timing of this. The world at large is not placing women at such high esteem. The scriptures have a way of esteeming women. And just so much that this, that the writer here characterizes something as intense and beautiful and, and mind-blowing as the wisdom of God. What if the scripture said, you know, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God is found, is found in the, in the drug addict. We would all go, what? We don't, we don't, we don't place a lot of value on that. The Bible here is pulling something in that's so beautiful. And there's something about, there's something about her that adds to what wisdom actually is. Because wisdom is presented as her, it is saying something other than if wisdom was presented as him. Wow. So Solomon asked God for what? One thing he asked for? Excellent. Now. <laughs> He's warmed up now. He's not going to blush. I might. Here we go. I'm going to wear my mask for this. Here we go. Open your Bibles to the Song of Songs. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. 17 of these? Yes, we can make it. Here we go. Here we go. Solomon's Song of Song. She says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder all these maidens love you. Take me away. Come on, let's hurry. Let the king, let him bring me into his private chambers. If you're thinking, I think that's interesting. And the friends looking on say, we rejoice. Oh, by the way, uh, theologians believe that these are not men and women, and these aren't the guys sitting around talking. It's the ladies. <laughs> the lady. The la I just picture them like, Watch this. We rejoice and we delight in you. We will praise your love. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. She. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, 
dark like the tents of Keter. This is a, this is a fascinating piece here. The tents of Keter and the, and the window dressings that they're going to talk about were made out of black goat's hair. Did you hear her words? She said, I am dark. Like the tents of Keter. Like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark. Because I am darkened by the sun. Oh, what joy she would have if she were living in 2021. Where ladies spray the darkness on. <laughs> but at this time, it's, it's not beautiful. Her. <laughs> oh, this blows my mind. She says, listen. The world at large does not acknowledge my beauty. Do you find that to be true in your life? That the world at large does not acknowledge the beauty of God's wisdom? What in the world? How lovely. How lovely. Dark like the tents of, of Keter. Like the tent curtains of Solomon, do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me, and they made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I have neglected. Is that, yeah. Vineyards create an intoxicating Tell me, you whom I love, where do you graze your flock? And where do you rest your sheep at midday? In other words, where do you take a break from being that hunky old shepherd? Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? In other words, I don't want to come chase you out in the middle of the field where everyone's looking at us. Instead, I want to catch you when you're quiet. I want to catch you when you're sitting down. I want to catch you when it's just you and me. And the whole idea here of veiled is I'm not a prostitute. The wisdom of God says, listen to me. I am not a cheap imitation of God's best. Somebody should say amen right about now. You could clap and blush at the same time. She says, listen, I'm not a cheap imitation just flaunting myself around to parade myself around all your friends. I'm after you, and I'm after your heart, and I want you quiet, and I want you alone, and I want to talk to you. <laughs> Woo! This is going to take nine weeks to preach. I'm enjoying it. If you do not know most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. These are the, uh, uh, the ladies talking. I liken you, my darling, to a, mare, uh, uh, um, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. This is him talking. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings. Them some big earrings. Am I right? Your cheeks. Hoop, hoops going on or something. We will make you earrings of gold and stud them with silver. We will adorn and draw attention and highlight the beauty of God's wisdom. My perfume, it spreads a wonderful fragrance. The king was at his table. My perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh. Resting between my breasts. Myrrh. Myrrh is what you would hide under your pillow to make your bed the place to be. Myrrh is what was brought to Jesus because it was the gift to a king. She's saying, I want to be your queen. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Most scholars believe that, that, was, that she had uh, used eyeshadow in a way 
that looked like wings that were flying. Beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. Oh, you stop. You hang up. I'm not hanging up. You hang up. Oh, my goodness. I love you. I love you, Lord. Love you. I double love you. Double no tack backs. You owe me a cook. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars. Our rafters are fir. And this is the reading from God's word, if you're feeling guilty. It's all right. It's a beautiful poem, and it's about, it's about love. It is about romantic love. It is about love between a man and a woman. It is about a higher theme of love. But here's the big idea. Because Matt Basinger said, Jared, you've been slacking on just spelling it out. What's the big idea? So I'm bringing the big idea back for you, big guy. So the big idea is this. Primarily, the Song of Songs is a poem that speaks of humanity's relationship with wisdom. Wrapped in a semi-erotic storyline meant to make you blush. Why? Why? Do you think that the Holy Spirit, being the great teacher, might be able to capitalize on certain uh, elements of the human experience that catch our attention, something like romance? Do you think that maybe even embedded in the very nature of who we are, that we were created in a way, with functions in a way, with desires in a way, that would not only populate the earth, but instead would populate the kingdom of God all at the same time? Do you think that maybe you are not just a cluster of of cells that just happenstantially came together in what we see as the incredible human mind and human uh, systems, but instead that you were created by God and that the very things that you have been created with are supposed to speak to you so that you can learn of higher things? So it is complex, and it does have double meaning, and it is supposed to be an experience. And that is the beauty and the wonderful kneeling down of God to go, I'll get on their level and I'll talk to them about things that they understand. Isn't that awesome? You've got a great God who stops at nothing to, to help you understand the secrets and the whispers of the kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? I'm glad he didn't present the Bible in a spreadsheet. I hate spreadsheets. I'm so glad that he will use all sorts of different ways to speak to us. So the big idea, the Song of Songs is this poem that, yes, it's talking about love, and yes, it's talking about a relationship, and it's also talking about humanity's relationship to wisdom. And I want to show you over the coming weeks just how incredible this is. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make us harken back to Eve. It's going to make us harken back to the temple. It's, tons of really cool stuff is going to happen. So at the core... Of the human experience, wisdom flirts. At the core of human existence, wisdom flirts with the excitement of your soul to come clean from sin you have committed. In the core of the human soul, It pulls the best out of you and says, come here. Wisdom calls out to you like on a street corner. And wisdom adorns herself so that you will choose the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God knows that it will get nowhere through force. That's actually assault. But instead, wisdom comes at us with a romantic flair. And it says, oh. Do you want to come clean? And I say, yeah. And wisdom says, come. Come clean of your sin. And I go, oh, it's a little, I don't, I don't know what to do with my hands, wisdom. Wisdom goes, come on, come on, come on. Let's become one. Let's intertwine your humanity with my wisdom. And let's get down to the core of who you are. No clothes, 
no pretenses, no lies, no arrogance, no pride. Wisdom says, get naked before me, and I will get naked with you, and we will reproduce something godly. (laughs) At the core of the human experience, wisdom flaunts her allure to help you understand things that are confusing. Wisdom walks by, says, Woo, you want to understand? And I say, Yeah, I do. Says, Oh, that's not confusing to me. You actually have read 17 uh, different websites to try and understand what the truth is, but I, wisdom, know what the truth is. Do you want to know what it is too? Yes, I would. I'll only speak it in whispers. That sounds a little bit close, wisdom. Wisdom, it doesn't seem like you speak too fast. Can you speed it up? No, no, no. I'm going to take my time. Wisdom, I'm demanding that you... No, 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 no. Wisdom's female body is not a microwave. Wisdom says, let's take our time. Do you want to know the things of God? Do you want to hear what the spirit of the living God is saying? Slow down. Close the door. Dim the lights. I just want to be with you. At the core of the human experience, wisdom excites your desire to escape the pitfalls you keep falling in. No, 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 no. Just come, 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 come. Let's go. Come on. No one's looking. Come here. Come on. Let's just make some choices and you quit falling into that hole. I know it always fills you with regret. It always fills you uh, with grief and, and guilt. Come, come, come. Just make a decision. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Just log off. Lose their number. Come on, come on, come on. We don't have to think about it. Let's go. Let's go be wise together. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Do you love me or not? Let's go. Come on, silly. But what if I get caught? No, no, no. Wisdom excites your desire to escape your foolishness. I remember a time uh, when a dear friend of mine was rejoicing that someone had dropped cash in her mailbox so that she could pay her bills. And, uh, and I had walked with her for quite some time, and, and I, had, I had gotten people who were good with finances to sit with her and help her do a budget, but she wouldn't show up. And, and I had, uh, the church had, had paid a lot of her bills, but every month it seemed like the money was vanishing and we didn't know where it was going, but she was rejoicing. And she said, oh, praise God, God came through, cash showed up in my mailbox. And Lady Wisdom, and, and, and Lady Wisdom said, hey, Jerry, you want to know what I think about it? I go, no, 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 I'm just rejoicing. I said, no, 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 come, 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 right now, get out of here. You want to know what I think about it? And the Spirit of God said to me, don't mistake the great physician for the great paramedic. I said, what? Wisdom? You're crazy. And Lady Wisdom said, don't mistake the great physician for the great paramedic. Yes, I love rushing into a crisis, but my goal is on her health, not on rescuing her every time she injures herself. Instead, I would love for her to walk away from the cliff instead of saving her halfway down the cliff. I would love to to set in motion a financial health in her life more than just bailing her out. And I said, oh, that's amazing. Wisdom? I would have never thought of that. Great physician? 
a great paramedic? And do you know it's been 10 years? 10 years from an encounter with the Spirit as a gift of my Lord. I got something I want to show you. <laughs> but the crowd's out there. The crowd's thinking that. This is, goes against the grain. I know. Don't worry about them. Shut the door. There's a spur of the moment, impulsive nature to the wisdom of God. Wisdom of God drives home and looks at the country road and goes, it's kind of dark out there and we got 20 minutes. The Spirit of God says, the Spirit of God says, you're going to have more fun alone with me than you will in this crowd. The Spirit of God, the wisdom of God has this wonderful spur of the moment nature. It's not planned. The wisdom of gaining the wisdom of God is not planned. It's not in the same room every time. It doesn't require you to be in the same position every time she speaks. The Spirit of God has a flutter and an urgency. Wisdom whisk us off to private places when group think just won't do. Would you say that we've experienced a year of group think? Who wants to be whisked off by the wisdom of God and go, oh, I have no clue what the, go what the group is saying, but me and my Bible and in a place of prayer and worship, I know what God thinks. And that's all I care about. Anyone else? The intimacy of the wisdom of God. <laughs> so how about you? Do you drop everything to listen in to what the wisdom of God is saying? Do you have a regular habit of reading the Proverbs? Do you have a regular habit of going before the Lord with nothing to say, but instead saying, here I am, God of heaven, I'm ready to listen? Is there an intimacy that you experience with the Spirit of God? And say, wisdom, please speak to me. Are you mesmerized by cultures, wisdom websites, and culture's wisdom centerfolds? Or do you go home to the wisdom that has given her life to you and seeks your good till death do you part? Or do you find yourself, do you find yourself scouring the streets and the internet for fake, easy, Cheap wisdom. And how about us? How about us? Wouldn't it be great if we were a people who when people would play worship music, we would say, this is my chance to get alone with wisdom. Glad the lights are low. Speak to me, Holy Spirit, right now. Wisdom, what do you think about my attitude? What do you think about what I said about the doorknob? It's just me and you. You can say whatever you want. Wisdom, wisdom, you don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to be embarrassed by what you need to say to me. And wisdom says, you don't have to be embarrassed about what you've done. We're going to correct that. I'm going to bring repentance to you. Can we be a church? That says, you know, I show up to Bible study because I want to know the beauty of the wisdom of God because sometimes she's ugly. Sometimes I don't trust her. Sometimes I don't want to hear what she has to say. But instead, I'm showing up to Bible study because I need the beauty of the wisdom of God to lure me in. Can we be a place that shows up for prayer and song that says, oh! 
There's nothing more invigorating than the pleasure of being with God's wisdom. And we run to it. Or we be a place that says, you know, I might be whisked off a doorstep handing food out. And he might give me wisdom for a stranger. Who are we going to be? And will you make a point to disciple someone else? That's the whole goal of our church. We want to help people obey Jesus in real time, one-on-one, life-on-life, friend-on-friend, family-on-family. Will we be a place that does that and relies on relies on wisdom rendezvous all day long. I was sitting with someone uh, just this week. And marriage is hard sometimes. Can I get an amen? The Holy Spirit spoke to us at the beginning of this year. And one of the three things that God has asked our church to do this year is to intentionally sow into marriages. And it is going to be incredible. Right now, it's a whiteboard and a few ideas. But before long, you're going to see stuff pop up. And that is the word of God telling us, so into marriages. And I was sitting with some people who were having a tough time. And what I wanted to say was, man, I want you to give it your all. And Lady Wisdom said, stop, shh. And it was almost like Lady Wisdom said, just start talking. And I said, listen, bud. I don't want you to give it your all. I want you to never give up. Because giving it your all is so subjective. And I don't want you to give until you just can't give anymore. Shut up. I want you to give and I want you to keep on giving. Until, uh, until, until someone else, until someone else traps you so that you can't give anymore. But I don't want you. I don't want you to give until you can, can't give anymore. Never give up. And it seemed like Lady Wisdom stepped in and said, oh, check this out. And I went, "Woo! God's wisdom is so much better than my wisdom. God's counseling is so much better than my counseling. God's marriage ideas are so much better than your marriage ideas. I remember one time we were uh, working in a church, Pastor Steve and I, and we, and we had some, some people coming into the church who spoke Spanish. And we met for three or four hours just, just getting pretty heated about what we were going to do about this. You know, should we, should we give them an earpiece and then, and then, and then uh, translate it into Spanish so they can hear it? No, 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 we shouldn't do that. We should do a Spanish service. Well, I don't know if we should do that. I mean, that's great. It's in their native language. But, but you know, uh, then, then we're not one congregation. Yeah, that's true. You know, maybe it would be weird to have a church that had... Some people here and some people here. We should just plant a new church that, that's just Spanish speaking. And all this uproar and all this group thing and all this wisdom that was just, we were doing our very best and we were struggling. And then Steve leans back in his chair. Who's ever had Steve lean back in his chair? You're like, rut row. And Steve says, I think the most loving thing would be to teach him English. You know, they've chosen to live in America, and it will change their life. It'll change their ability to get jobs. It'll change their ability to function. If they knew English, everything would change. Well, I was going to actually say that if you didn't interrupt me, Steve. I'm just getting out all my bad ideas before. The wisdom of God sometimes is flirting with you. And the Spirit is calling you into experiencing all that he wants to show you. And I hope over the coming weeks that we blush together. That God uses even the chemical reactions that we all feel when we read this scripture. I hope that he uses all those things to teach us more about our relationship with his wisdom. Do you feel it already? Is there anybody in the room who already feels it? Just like God's talking. Amen.